Joining me on this video is Pumpkin Queen. She's a very talented narrator that I've been enjoying for quite a while. A link to her channel will be in the description below. She usually does no sleep stories and creepypastas with the occasional SCP thrown in for good measure. So if you're into that kind of stuff like I am, do me a favor and go check out her channel. Now with all that being said, let's get to the insane deep woods and cult stories. This really freaked me out at the time. If anyone has a solid idea of what this was or if they have had a similar experience, I would love to hear it. This happened to me a while back when I decided to go on another camping trip alone. I always liked camping alone. There's something serene and sobering about being isolated in the middle of the wilderness and I always found it relaxing. So I planned out what trail I was going to take, packed my camping gear and my rifle for protection and jumped in my truck. I get to this trail early in the morning and hike about 15 to 20 miles in until I find the right spot and head off the trail to find a place to put my tent up. I stumble upon this nice sized clearing and decide that it's a nice beautiful spot to settle down. I'm exhausted at this point but set up the tent at the southernmost edge of the clearing next to the tree line and manage to get a fire going. I roast some weenies and start to hear a sound off in the distance underneath all the forest noises. It sounded like an animal, most likely a deer with a lame leg as it sounded like the animal was making a walking, dragging noise. I felt bad for the poor guy but it was too far away and it was getting dark so I couldn't really go find it and put it out of its misery. I think nothing of it after that and go about eating my food. After I eat, I douse the fire and crawl into my tent and insert myself into my sleeping bag. I decide that even at my exhausted and relaxed state, I can't go to sleep, so I pull out a book I brought with me and start to read by the light of my lamp. Hours go by and I hear that sound again, this time closer, right at the opposite side of the clearing. Surprised, I put my book down and listen to this animal walk drag across the clearing towards my tent. It's really loud at this point and it now sounds like the hooves are all being heavily planted with the dragging noise following seconds after, like the deer is dragging something along. It makes it to about what I assume is the middle of the clearing and stops, and I hear nothing. No breathing, I mean, not a sound from this animal. I unzip the tent and look into the clearing, nothing but trees and darkness. What the fuck? Unnerved at this point, I zip the tent back up and sit there listening for other noises. Nothing, just the crickets and the breeze. I decide that there are a lot of strange noises in the woods and try not to let it bother me. Besides, I had my rifle. I start to doze off when I hear men's laughter off in the distance to my right, then women's laughter and sticks snapping far off to my left. I'm up now, wondering if what I am hearing is really what I am hearing or just a product of being half asleep. I hear more faint laughing from a couple of other directions, all different, old men, old women, even children and confirm that it is real. The noises are closing in and I grab my rifle preparing to fire a warning shot off in the air in case they came too close. Something about this laughter, how far in I was, the noise earlier, and the time of night told me that this was not just another family strolling through. I was on edge enough already, but then I noticed that the nightlife was dead quiet. Not even the wind was making any noise. I decided enough was enough. I unzipped the tent and fired a shot into the night. I sat there and surveyed the tree line, saw nothing, listened intensely to my surroundings, no laughing and the four sounds had returned. Relaxing just a bit and figuring that scared whoever off, I sat down and in my exhausted state I fell asleep. I wake up later in a cold sweat, racked with anxiety and it was still dark outside. I immediately hear two people whispering not too far from my tent. Now alert, I grab my rifle and listen to what they are saying. I can't make much out but I hear something about being lost, so I shouted, Hey! Who's there? The voices fall silent. I shout again, Are you guys lost? Who's there? Suddenly, a huge burst of flame, like a flamethrower, erupted from the middle of the clearing, illuminating several silhouettes of people just standing around. In shock, I fire my rifle, blowing a hole in the front of my tent, and it goes dark. Without checking my surroundings, I get up and sprint out of my tent, making a hard left back to where the trail was. I hiked until sunrise back to my truck with my head over my shoulder the entire way. Never heard anyone follow me, never saw anyone or anything the whole way, but couldn't shake the feeling I was being watched. After that, 
My enjoyment of camping alone left me like I left all my gear in the woods that night. Figure in the fog. Not sure if this is the right place to post this, but here it goes. I went to a high school in a small Minnesota town, mostly farmland intersected by wooded areas, and of course, dozens of small lakes. One side of my neighborhood was bordered by relatively large marshlands that you could access by the slope that wound down to the trail. This trail curved through a marsh into a big patch of woods about three quarters of a mile away. In the fall springtime, even heavy rains or fog would often settle over this marsh, as it was so much lower than the surrounding area and it truly looked like something out of a Stephen King novel. After one of these rains, my brother and I, he was probably 13 and I was 16, decided it would be a great idea to go explore the woods in the fog. Although the sun was setting fast, we knew that we could make it to the woods in about 10 minutes if we left immediately. We grabbed a couple of flashlights knowing that it would be dark by the time we got home and headed for the trail. Once we were in the trail and moving, it hit us how thick the fog was. We had only been walking for a minute or two, but we had absolutely no visibility behind us at 5 or 10 feet max in front of us. We continued walking for a few more minutes, bullshitting about hearing noises and seeing red eyes in the distance the whole time until we came to a curve in the trail. The curve signaled that we were only about 100 yards from the entrance to the woods. At this point, there was a small lake on the left side of the trail and miles of marshland on the right. It's important to note that we have moved farther and farther away from many houses. Our house was the closest to the trail, and the trail moved away from our neighborhood rather than boarding any backyards. We began walking past the lake, and then we heard a splash. Definitely larger than a fish jumping, but we had no idea what else would have made the noise. We stopped, waited, and upon hearing nothing else, continued on our way. We could have been going for more than 15 seconds when we heard cracking and shuffling in the bush, up ahead to our left. We stopped dead on our tracks and waited, at the end of our eyesight, which could have been only about ten feet, a figure stepped out of the bush, bordering the lake. The fog was so thick to make out any details, but it must have been at least six foot and four inches, and a very broad shouldered. As the figure made its way into the middle of the trail, my brother gasped and it stopped. Its head shot over and looked right at us and just stared. It felt like an entity, but it couldn't have been more than a few seconds. I felt true terror that moment, and I've never replicated that feeling. I began to take small steps backwards, and suddenly the figure took off running into the marshland. Again, there are no houses or buildings or anything for miles in the direction that it ran. Surface to say, my brother and I sprinted back to the house faster than I've ever ran. I still don't know what or who I saw that day. I hope I never do. Growing up, I had a childhood friend that lived relatively close by, and we were like two peas in a pod. We both were adventurous, believed in the paranormal, enjoyed astronomy, and generally just being outside. She was born in Alaska, and her dad had lived there for quite a while, so they were always into camping, hiking, fishing, skiing, you name it. It was with my friend's family that I got introduced to fishing and did a lot of camping. This happened during the mid to late 90s, and we were maybe around 10 to 12 years old. It's been a while, so I can't remember exactly. One camping trip, we went to this lake in the forest that was surrounded by a meadow and feeding the lake was a small stream leading out of the woods. Anyways, we played in the meadow and stream all day while my friend's dad fished. 
The lake wasn't very big, and because it had a meadow all around it, he could keep an eye on our whereabouts while he fished. While messing around by the stream, the wooded area it was coming from gave me weird vibes. Can't explain it, I just felt really uneasy. Anyway, the day faded away into early evening, and it was time to leave and find a camping spot. My friend's dad packed up his fishing gear, and we all walked back to the truck on this long, winding path through the woods. Once in the truck, we drove into a more remote area of the forest and made our way up this steep road that was so rough and at such an incline that I was convinced that my friend's dad was going to break his truck. He had a four, maybe six-cylinder Toyota pickup that was about as basic as a truck could get. In fact, I'm not even sure if the truck had four-wheel drive, but being an Alaskan outdoorsman with years of experience, I trusted him. We finally made it up to the top, which was flat and relatively open with a big area of forest in the opposite direction from the road we drove up. We pitched our tents, got everything set up, and my friend and I decided to go explore the area. We were maybe 50 yards from the tent when we heard a big crack as a tree branch snapped in the woods behind us. We got quiet and looked in that direction, but didn't see anything. Thinking it was just a deer, we brushed it off. As we were walking, we heard it again and whispered to one another about what it could be, but kept going. It stopped briefly, and when we were about 200 yards from our camp, we sat on a boulder looking down the steep wooded hill overlooking the dirt road from where we had come from. Suddenly, we heard another cracking branch from behind. Whatever it was seemed to be following us. Our imaginations going wild, we came up with everything from a serial killer stalking us in the woods to deer to Bigfoot. When we got back to the campsite, we told her dad what we had heard and how it seemed to be paralleling us. He kind of played it off as a black bear and secured all the food. Later on, my friend confided in me that her dad had gotten out his pistol and would be sleeping with it that night. My friend and I were sharing one tent, and he was in his own tent not far from us, so we figured everything would be okay. I awoke sometime in the middle of the night to hearing someone or something walking around outside. As I lay still listening, I could hear it quietly circling the tent. It sounded like it was walking on two legs because it had a distinct rhythm in how it walked. Whatever it was sounded big as I could hear its weight, if that makes any sense, as it put each foot down and walked. I could even hear relatively quiet but deep heavy breathing at times. As I lay there listening, I could hear it wandering to the other parts of the campsite and then back to our tent, almost as if it was walking in a big, repetitive loop. This went on for who knows how long. It felt like an eternity. Terrified and unable to wake my friend, I lay there and listened until I eventually fell asleep. The next morning, I told my friend and her dad about it, but I don't know if they believed me or not. Interestingly, absolutely nothing in the camp was disturbed in any way. The ground was not very soft and in some places was covered in grass, so there were no footprints either. This is something that I have never been able to explain and to this day lingers in the back of my mind when camping. I always wonder what it was that walked around our tent all night. The most dangerous game. I grew up in the Midwest. About 10 years ago, I moved to a small coastal town in the Pacific Northwest, where I work for a company that runs cabin restaurants and water taxi service transporting campers and hunters, and sometimes fright, to various locations, sometimes just 20 minutes away, sometimes hours away. During the winter, a few years ago, we had a couple stay in one of our very basic cabins, like the kind of cabin you'd stay in a summer camp. My understanding was the guy, Dick, was taking a class at a trade school in town, so he'd be gone all day, while the woman, Jane, stayed in the cabin with the three dogs. We never saw her outside while he was away. One day, Jane burst into the office in tears, hysterical. She told us Dick had been beating her for days, starving her, that he'd been locking her in the cabin while he was away, that he even threatened her with his dogs. We immediately called the police to the office, and while we waited for them to arrive, she told us in details of their relationship. Jane was from South Africa and came from quite a wealthy family. Her family had recently passed away and she received quite a large inheritance. She met Dick on social media sites 
and he sold her on this bogus dream of building a remote lodge and has even convinced her to transfer all this money she just inherited to his bank account which he spent on remote piece of property, a new truck and a boat among other things. Jane was totally at Dick's mercy. She voluntarily transferred the money to him. It's evidence that she grown up wealthy. She didn't seem to have any idea how to take care of herself. By the time the police arrived, she'd reserved his story. She wouldn't tell them he hit her, threatened her, or locked her in the cabin. I'd walked over to the cabin with the officer to talk to Dick. And of course, he denied everything. The cop was very frustrated. It was clear Dick was mistreating her, but he didn't have enough to make an arrest. I told Dick he needed to leave the property anyway. I didn't want him here, and the woman didn't want to go with him. Jane had managed to get in touch with a friend in the US, who bought her a plane ticket. Another employee and I had offered to drive her to the airport in the city about 200 miles away. That very night, Dick left without issue, and the last thing I said to him was don't come back. And that, if I ever saw his truck in our area again, I would assume he was there to cause trouble. I would call the police without hesitation. I felt terrible for this woman. She basically made a bad investment and had little hope for recovering any of that money. Months pass. It was well into the summer, and I'd but forgotten about this incident. I heard Jane had gotten back to Dick, and that they were back in town from another water taxi operator. He'd been transporting them to and from their remote property, because Dick wrecked the boat he bought with Jane's money on the rocky beach. One day I answered a phone call from a very distraught woman from the other side of the country. She was desperately trying to find her son, who had answered and had Dick had posted online looking for help doing construction at his remote property. She would just been calling water taxi operators in his area, asking if anyone knew this Dick guy. Apparently, her son Mike had called her from a satellite phone out of the property and told her he was in danger. They weren't getting along, and Dick finally ran him off. This property was out in the middle of nowhere, accessible only by sea or air. No roads. You can't just tell someone to leave. Where would they go? Mike's mother relates to me that Dick wouldn't let him sleep in the cabin, that he wouldn't share food, and that he even chased him with a rifle when he realized Mike had sat on the phone. It was lucky he managed to get a call out. Mike's mother called with the intention of hiring us to pick up her son. I told her, Miss, this is an emergency. We need to contact the police. I contacted the state police and coast guard immediately, and they jointly dispatched the boat and a helicopter to the area to rescue this guy. Mike was rescued safely, and Dick was arrested. Jane was there too, but refused to come back with the police, and stayed at the cabin. Mike came out of the office a few days later to meet me. He gave me a big hug and thanked me. He was convinced I'd saved his life, which was a nice sentiment, but in my opinion, the police and the coast guards saved his life. He told me in some more details of his experience that Dick had actually taken several shots at him while chasing him through the woods. He told me when Dick caught up to him, he held him at gunpoint, ordered him to strip naked and locked him in a shipping container that he had on property. He was convinced that he was going to die. He was still locked in a shipping container when the state police arrived. Mike didn't stay for long. But I was impressed that he took the time to come out and introduce himself, and I wished him luck. Dick was charged with attempt murder, but I believe those charges were ultimately dropped. 
and that Mike ended up with a hefty settlement for that inheritance money Dick was swiddled from Jane. I received a phone call later that summer from a reporter in the city asking about what had happened. Mike's mother had given him my information. I agreed to tell him what I knew and continued that he not mention my name or the name of the company I worked for, which he mentioned anyway. The story is still available online and I might be willing to share the link privately if anyone is interested, as long as it stays private. The other night I was having a few beers with my neighbor Al, a young guy who moved to town last year. This story popped into my head, and when I mentioned Dick's name, he perked up. They worked together at the shipyard. I can't believe it. This motherfucker is back in town. Without Jane this time. Working a minimum wage job. So Dick, you lord of the fly psychopath. That's not me. I grew up in Ohio in the 70s, and me and my childhood friend Joe were outside all the time we could manage it. Joe lived on a farm that bordered a pretty big forest and my parents would drop me off in the morning and we'd stay in the woods all weekend. We'd only come out for school. We loved pretending we were frontiersmen. We'd build shelters, traps, practice making fires with sticks, the whole nine yards. When we got to be in high school, we got this notion to pull a stand by me. This was based on the movie of the same name that had just come out. The idea was that we'd walk the railroad tracks out into the country, but instead of looking for a dead body, we'd find cool bridges to fish from and camp a little way off the tracks. Of course, we knew this was dangerous and we'd likely be trespassing, but we were kids. We had a lot of fun. We did find beautiful rivers. We discovered bridges no one went to. We fished. We hid from trains. At night, we camped in the woods just near the tracks and made small hidden fires. Nothing bad ever happened. It was idyllic. In fact, it was so fun we did it multiple times. Never had a problem. After high school, me and Joe went our own ways. We both left home, but always stayed in touch and always tried to coordinate visits so we'd see each other occasionally. Well, one summer in the mid-90s, it worked out that we were both in town for about a week. We'd do stuff with the family in the day, and at night we'd either catch drinks at a bar or sit outside Joe's house around a fire and talk about the old days. One night, me and Joe got to talking about our standby me trips. Well, nostalgia and beer are a hell of a mix. Soon we decided to take a day, walk the rails, camp one night, and walk home. The day came. We started out early morning. We had my wife drop us off in our old spot where we used to start, right outside our hometown. She thought this was absolutely crazy and made sure to mention it. When she pulled away, Joe suggested that instead of walking the usual route, we take the opposite direction, just to be adventurous. We knew the land well, we had a map, so I gave a what the hell and we set off. The day went fine, it was fun and a little sad, but in a good way. We found a bridge and sat on the edge, smoked a joint and moved on. We had no fishing gear, but we brought some canned food and other stuff. Before night started to set in, we picked a spot to camp. It was a thick forested area, trees on every side of the train track so you felt like you were in a tunnel. We had brought small hammocks to sleep on, but before we set them up, we decided to do a little scouting of the perimeter. Now this is what we used to do in the old days too. We'd walk the area around a little bit to make sure some dude's house wasn't just over a hill and we were actually camping in their yard. We walked maybe a hundred or so feet into the woods and up a small incline. We figured if we didn't see anything from on top of this short hill we'd be fine. But when we got to the top, we saw an old building down at the bottom, about a hundred yards into the woods. It was barely visible. We pondered over what to do. We both assumed it was a sugar shack or something because there didn't appear to be a clear road into it. From where we were, there didn't look to be anyone in it either. All was quiet, no movement could be seen, and no lights. We decided to walk a little closer just to make sure. We came down the hill very slowly, and as we neared the building, we saw it wasn't a sugar shack at all. It was an old church. It looked like it had been abandoned for years. It was a squat, sagging building whose wooden planks were almost black from years of moss and rot. A cross still stood on top of the place, also weathered black. None of the windows had glass, and there were no doors, just open doorways. We got close enough to see inside. There were rows of pews and a built-up section in front for a preacher to stand. We didn't go all the way in. We didn't want to. Beyond all that, there was no sign of anyone else, no footprints, no paths, no roads. 
it was an abandoned church. We left immediately and went back up the hill to our spot we had picked to camp. Having a hill between us and the church made us feel better, but we were still a little uneasy. We chalked it up to the natural creepiness seeing a church in the middle of the woods would elicit. Besides, at this point it was dusk and we just decided to rig up our hammocks and go to sleep and move on at early morning. Night set in, and as we lay in our hammocks and shot the shit, we began to hear something in the direction of the church. Our conversation about it went a little like this. Do you hear that? Yeah, what the fuck is that? It sounds like... people singing. And it did sound just like singing. We both slid right out of our hammocks and hunkered down, straining to hear more. We listened for a minute or two and the singing continued, but it wasn't getting louder. Finally, we decided to creep back up the hill and see if we could spy where the sound was coming from. We could still move very quietly in the woods from the old days. It was second nature to us. The moon was barely out, but it provided enough light so you wouldn't walk right into a tree, but it was near pitch black. We didn't use flashlights as we crept slowly up the hill and we didn't talk. When we got to the top, we saw light in the distance. It was coming from the church, and the singing was coming from inside. Joe and I put our heads close together and had a hushed conversation that boiled down to, Can you believe this shit? The light looked to be candlelight from the way it flickered, and though we tried, we couldn't make out what was being sung. It sounded like church music, but in another language. We sat and watched for a while, trying to see who was in there, but we only saw occasional shadows. We had no intention of getting closer either. We had about a football field length between us, and we aimed to keep it that way. The singing continued for a bit, and then it stopped. After that, a booming male voice began to chant. I was already freaked out, but this voice thoroughly scared the shit out of me. It sounded like some Old Testament preacher you see in movies, but again it was like he was speaking in a different language because we couldn't understand a single word. Eventually it got to where the single male voice would say something and then a bunch of voices would answer in song. This lasted for a while, and then they all broke into this long, sustained wail that just kept getting louder. It got so loud and so disturbing that I covered my ears. Then it stopped. At this point, I was just getting ready to say let's get the fuck out of here when Joe put a hand on my shoulder and hissed, they're coming out. We were far enough away that we couldn't make them out really well, but what we could see was a line of figures walk out the open doorway, all holding hands in single file. We could see some of them had flashlights. They began to sing again, and the light from the flashlights began to move toward us in the hill. We booked it down to our campsite, grabbed our shit, and ran to the tracks. Once there, we ran down the tracks in the direction we had come from. A few minutes later, we stopped and looked back. We saw lights coming down the hill. They were moving erratically, like whoever was holding them was shaking them. We continued to run in spurts and walk as fast as we could. We eventually stopped seeing the lights and came to a road. By our map, we knew a small town was about 15 minutes down it, and we walked there, got to a 24-hour gas station and called my wife to come get us. My wife and other friends all just thought it was kids messing around, but I heard those voices, and they sure as hell didn't sound like kids to me. Not sure who those people were, but it was definitely the creepiest thing that happened to me out in the woods. This did not happen to me. But I live in the area where it took place. As far as I know, this is not a made up story. My friend and I were discussing the scary things we've seen in the woods, and he told me a story that happened to his friend. So this guy with five of his friends were spending a few days in a cabin hunting and trapping. They weren't drunk, but had a few beers to unwind one night. So one of them goes out to the outhouse to go to the bathroom, and he swears that off into the woods he hears the faint sound of a drum beating. So he finishes in the outhouse and goes into the cabin and tells his friends to come check this out. So they all grab their rifles and walk out to the ridge their cabin was on and down below the hollow behind it and back up to the other side. It was a pretty rocky area so the sound traveled far and they could tell that just over the hill was where the sound was coming from. So five of them spread out about 50 feet apart and walk up to the top. They couldn't see down over because of all the laurel bushes around. So five of them wait and one of them sneaked down through to see what it was. When he got there, he stood and watched for about 30 seconds to a minute before he turned around and went to his friends as fast as he could, telling them he saw evil and they had to get the hell out of there right then. All he would tell them is he saw a bunch of naked men and women dancing around in a circle chanting something in a foreign language. 
He never told them about everything he saw. The guy who told my friend this story was one of the guys who hung back and didn't see what happened. This happened back in 2004 in northern Wisconsin. I was 16 at the time and was out deer hunting with my dad and a friend of his, Frank. I remember this day like it was yesterday. The dialogue isn't word for word, but the idea of it is 100% accurate. As a side note, it was one day after eight people were shot less than two hours away. My dad and I had a few different stands over an area of maybe three quarter square mile. He had been hunting there for at least 10 years, and I had been going with him since I was five. Up until I was 12, legal age to hunt with a rifle, I had just been tagging along. This particular morning, we walked to my stand first. It was about 5 a.m., so it was still dark outside. I got situated, and my dad and Frank went off to our other two stands over a ridge, maybe another 500 to 600 yards off. Sitting there in the dark is always a little eerie. Not long after my dad and Frank left, I see a flashlight from the general direction of which they headed, maybe 200 yards away, roughly moving my direction. I figured they forgot something from the truck or something, so I radioed to see what they were doing. We're sitting in my stand. Frank is about to head to the other one, he says. Obviously, this flashlight is someone else. This isn't super uncommon and isn't really a big deal. Those woods get crowded sometimes and there's a spot to park in that general direction. I turn on my light so the other hunter can see that there is someone there. He stops. I see the light turn and go a different direction. No big deal. I end up dozing off while it's still dark out. When I wake up, the sun is up. It's around 8 a.m. I sit there for a bit, radio my dad to see if he has heard, seen anything moving. Nothing yet. A couple gunshots off in the distance is all. I get up and go for a slow little walk to get my blood moving a bit. Not far, maybe 30 yards out and back. Trying not to make a sound. I come back to my stand, sit down and take a real good look around. Nothing really going on. I finally look out to my left, where I had seen the flashlight before, and see orange. For anyone unfamiliar, hunters have to wear blaze orange during gun season. I radio my dad and Frank to see if either one of them were moving around. Dad says no. I hear nothing from Frank. I grab the binoculars out of my backpack to see if it's Frank. It's definitely not. This guy is looking at me through a scope, rifle aimed directly at me. This is a huge no-no. Massive rule we all learn in hunter's education, never point your rifle at something you don't intend to shoot. Dumb people still do it though. It's few and far between, but it happens. This is why normal people use binoculars. My first thought, what a fucking dickbag. Thing is, even with me looking at him, he doesn't put his gun down. Now I'm starting to panic, thinking I'm going to be the next hunting murder victim. I slowly grab my rifle, get up, staying behind as many trees as I can and walk down a little path to the side of my stand. My stand was on this kind of little knoll on the side of a much larger hill. Radio my dad, tell him what's up. He tells me to sit tight and stay out of sight. Obviously, as a 16 year old, I couldn't do that and had to keep looking. Every time I looked, the guy was still aiming in my direction, but was always standing in a different spot. Like I would look, go back to hiding, look again, and he would be 30 yards from where he was the last time. About 10 minutes of this goes by when my dad radios me. How you doing, bud? Looking back, he was very obviously trying to keep calm. At the time, I thought he just wasn't taking me seriously. He's still there, but he keeps moving. I don't know what his problem is. Dad told me to just keep hiding and he'll figure it out. That I'll be coming up near him in a minute or two. That's when I hear the shot. I lost my shit trying to get a hold of my dad. Did he just get shot? Where the fuck is he? Did he have to shoot the guy? What the fuck is going on? I sit there for maybe two to three minutes that felt like hours. All right, come on out and head toward my stand, dad says. I peek up over the little knoll I was behind and see my dad waving from along the ridge the random guy had been on. I make the trek on over to him to see what happened. Turns out, Frank was feeling a little restless and took a little stroll and ended up on the other side of the particular ridge the stranger was on, not knowing he was there. He had knocked his radio battery loose while he was getting situated earlier in the morning and had no idea anything was even going on. The shot I heard was actually Frank shooting a deer. Dad said as soon as Frank shot, the guy walked off away from us toward the logging road. We helped Frank out with his deer and decided to call it an early day. Although I was extremely nervous, the rest of the week went on with no incidents. 
This all started when I decided to sleep over at my boyfriend's house last night. The night had gone normal. We went to bed early and nothing out of the ordinary seemed to happen. For some reason though, I kept waking up randomly in the middle of the night and my boyfriend didn't seem to sleep much at all. He said he just felt distressed. Anyway, I remember I woke up sometime late in the night. I was instantly filled with a feeling of discomfort, as though something bad was close. Just outside his window I heard flutes. There were maybe three or four of them and they were all playing some weird and ominous song. I sat up quickly and was going to look out the window, but something stopped me. I was just too scared of what I might see. After a few minutes I managed to look. Right behind my boyfriend's house there is a small forest by a park. It is fairly dense, but that entire area is just sort of creepy, especially since there is hardly anyone ever at the park. The flutes continued for a little while and I jumped when I felt my boyfriend grab me and pull me down beside him. He hugged me instantly and the flutes stopped right away. He made a few sounds of discomfort, something he usually does when he is scared or distressed. I could only stare through the darkness, trying to figure out what had happened. When I checked the time on my phone, it was around 2.30 in the morning. The next morning I told my boyfriend and we talked about what had happened. I'm a guy who's pretty skeptical about things, so I tried to find a logical explanation, but I couldn't think of anything. I had never heard that sort of sound before in my life. My boyfriend told me that when he woke up and grabbed me, he felt really distressed, as I had thought, but he said he didn't know why. He said when he saw me looking out the window, his first instinct was to get me away from it and stop me from looking out of it. He said he never heard the flutes and he seemed freaked out when I told him. Now, my boyfriend has had quite a few paranormal experiences, but none that had involved me like this before. He has indigenous background, so I thought it might be something similar to that, especially since he thought he had seen what might have been a wendigo sometime in the summer. Does anyone have any idea what this might have been? It has left me feeling really strange and I'm not quite sure what it all means.